Welcome to your chapter on musculoskeletal alterations. We'll start by again always looking at the pediatric differences. You can kind of read through those on your own. I just want to add that calcium intake is necessary in childhood to ensure adequate bone density to prevent osteoporosis and fractures in adulthood. And I just want to remind you guys, um, since we're talking about musculoskeletal things, ligaments connect bones to bones and form joints. Tendons connect muscles to bones. One of the most difficult aspects of illness in a child is immobility. Some of the frequent reasons for mobility include congenital defects, perhaps say from something like spina bifida, degenerative disorders such as the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. It can also result from infections or injuries that impair the integumentary, neurologic, or musculoskeletal systems such as severe burns, trauma, traumatic brain injury, Guillain-Barre syndrome, spinal cord injuries, things like that. Your slide goes over some of the effects of the immobilization have on children. Therapies that prolong immobilization, such as traction and spinal fusion, can also cause immo immobilization. Table 48.1 in your book is a really good resource. Please review it. This graphic just shows a pictorial representation of all the ways that immobilization affects the body. It's bad for children and adults. As you can see, there are many, many effects. So now let's talk about traumatic injury. We're talking about injuries to the soft tissues, muscles, ligaments, and tendons. Those things usually happen in children due to play or, and or sports injuries. Contusion means that we have damage to soft tissue, subcutaneous tissue, and muscle. There is an escape of blood into tissues that causes ecchymosis, the black and blue discoloration. It also causes swelling, pain, and some disability. Usually it's the result of a crushing injury, such as fingers slammed in doors or getting hit with a hammer. Dislocations mean that there's displacement of normal position of opposing bone ends or of bone ends to a socket. This occurs when the force of stress on ligaments is sufficient to cause displacement. Classic example is parents jerking the arm of a child to catch them before they fall, like in roller skating, or swinging kids around by their arms. These can be fixed under conscious sedation. The faster they are healed, the easier they are to fix. Pain increases with the active and passive movement of the affected extremity. Hip dislocations can occur after a fall. The risk with hip, with hip dislocations is potential loss of blood supply to the head of the femur, so these need to be fixed within 60 minutes after the injury. Shoulder dislocations are common after sports injuries. The child may be in a sling temporarily until it is fixed and healed. Sprains are just trauma to a joint from a ligament partially or completely torn or stretched by force. It may be associated with damage to blood vessels, muscles, tendons, and nerves. Presence of joint laxity is an indicator of the severity. Rapid onset of swelling is normal um, with some amount of disability. Strains, they are a lot like a sprain, except the injury occurs over time versus a sprain that is more of an acute injury. So you're running or you step on something in your ankle, wobbles and rolls, that would, be an, an, that would be an example of a sprain. A strain would be using a muscle, um, doing CrossFit, you, doing some sort of repetitive motion over and over that over time, um, that over time gets damaged. So therapeutic management of soft tissue injuries, the first 12 hours are the most critical period for management of soft tissue injuries. The two acronyms you need to remember are RICE, which stands for rest the injured part, ice it immediately afterwards, compression and elevation. And the other one is ISIS, which stands for ice, compression, 
elevation and support, not the terrorist group. Fractures. In children, the good news is fractures heal faster in children than they do in adults. So that means their period of immobilization is not going to be nearly as long. Typical healing in children, if it's a neonate, two to three weeks. If it's in early childhood, about four weeks. Later childhood, six to eight weeks. And adolescence, eight to 12 weeks. Fractures are often the result of accidents at home, school, MBAs, or with recreational activities. Any child who has a fracture who is less than one needs to be evaluated for child abuse. Multiple fractures that are not the result of abuse or neglect could be indicative of osteogenesis imperfecta. Distal forearm fractures involving the radius, ulna, or both is the most common. Clavicle fractures are also common. Clavicle fractures are getting more common in babies from shoulder dystocia. The next few slides just go over the different types of fractures and so read through those so that you understand the differences and the types of fractures. Now growth plate injuries are kind of a big deal because damage to the growth plate can affect future bone growth. Unfortunately, it's a frequent site of damage during trauma. The weakest point of long bones is the cartilaginous growth plate, also known as the epiphyseal plate. Diagnosis and management includes taking x-rays, taking a history, find out what was happening when the injury occurred. Um, and you can, you can be suspicious of fracture in young children who refuse to walk or bear weight on something such as their leg or refuse to use their arm. <clears throat> Sometimes in children, if they cannot move, if you tell them to raise their arm and they're unable to do it, that would be indicative of a fracture as well. Other signs would be generalized swelling, pain, tenderness. Um, I just already mentioned diminished functional use of the affected part. There may or may not be bruising. Severe muscle rigidity or crepitus may, may also be there. And you can read through the goals of fracture management. All right, so for the assessment of fractures, you need to remember the six Ps. And if I referenced something like the emergency box on page 1539, I would probably take the time to read through that. So your nursing care for fractures, you can read through the things that are on your slide. I just want to also throw in that in children, most balanced skeletal traction is applied to allow physiologic stability, to align the bone fragments, and to enable closer evaluation of the injured site. However, newer technology is allowing for orthopedic fixation devices that allow for greater mobility. Mobility, good. Immobility, bad. It also helps to relieve fatigue of the involved muscles. It works to position the distal and proximal bone ends together. Um, it does help to immobilize the fracture site, prevent deformities, um, and you want to prevent further injury. It also helps to reduce muscle spasms. When hospitalized, make sure you think about lots of distraction toys because kids with limited mobility get bored and there's only so many times they can play Mario Kart. Discharge teaching, if they're going home with a cast, don't get it wet. <laughs> no swimming. You're going to have to wrap it up when you shower. Don't even wrap it up and say, I'm going to wrap it up and go swimming. Just don't swim. All right, developmental dysplasia of the hip. This used to be called congenital hip dysplasia or congenital dislocation of the hip. 
the incidence is about one and a half. I don't know who the half a person is, but one and a half for every 1,000 live births. So it doesn't happen very often. It is more commonly affected in girls than it is boys, and there's usually a strong familial history. It can include, well, you can read through that on your slide, actually. It's more common in breech deliveries. Um, the cause is really unknown. Genetics, again, likely. That's why I said there's a strong familial history. You can have complete dislocation, which you have displacement of the bone from its normal articulation within the joint. So it's just completely displaced. You can have subluxation, which is a partial dislocation. You can have dysplasia, which is abnormal cellular or structural development leading to the instability. Girls are more affected due to the maternal estrogen, which causes laxity of hip joints. Girls respond to that maternal estrogen, boys do not. That's why we see it more in girls than boys. All right, so this is a good graphic. If you look over there at the picture that says normal, you can see how that ball and socket joint fits nice and tight and snug. Then in, uh, with a, dis, with a dysplasia, that's preluxation. It's called acetabular dysplasia or preluxation. It's the mildest form of this. Um, you get a little bit of osseous hypoplasia of the acetabular roof. Femoral head does remain in the acetabulum though. Then with subluxation, you get incomplete dislocation of the hip. See how that ball is starting to pull away from that joint a little bit and you can see a little bit more, you can see a little bit more of that uh, ligament. And then with dislocation, wow, look at that. Um, the femoral head loses contact with the acetabulum and it is displaced posteriorly or superiorly. Ligaments are elongated and very taut. Ouch. So this is a cute little picture of a little baby girl. And if you can see, she has asymmetry in her gluteal and thigh folds. See, when you look at her left leg, there's one, two, three, like folds, but when you look on the right, you don't see that same many, you don't see as many folds. So that tells you that there's asymmetry there. What do we like in babies? We want things symmetric. When things aren't symmetric, that tells us that something is off. So that's how we know that this child probably has a developmental dysplasia of the hip. They will do a hip ultrasound for further diagnosis. So what you're looking for when you're assessing an infant for this is hip joint laxity. Again, you may see a shortened limb on the affected side. When you flip them over prone, you'll see uneven gluteal folds. Um, the Ortolani and Barlow tests are most accurate from birth to four weeks of age. With the Barlow test, you um, lay the infant on their back and then you will adduct their thighs. With the Ortolani test, you abduct the thighs to check for hip subluxation or dislocation. There is usually an audible click or clunk sometimes with these tests. Nurses used to do this in the nursery. I was taught how to do this in the nursery, but by the time I left working on the inpatient side, the doctors just said that they would prefer that only they were the ones that did it, and so nurses quit doing it. It used to be part of our initial admission assessment of a newborn, and by the time I left, we just skipped over that and that was one less thing to do. So most of the time just the pediatricians do this now. Now the good news with DDH is that 60 to 80 percent of the hip abnormalities resolve by two months of age. Um, early intervention though is really important. For um, pretty severe cases or for case, certainly cases of complete dislocation, you would want a, um, usually a Pavlik harness is what is ordered for the child. They, that works very well for birth to age six months. Um, it causes abduction of the hip. It allows for movement while keeping the hips flexed and the adduction does not allow the hip, does not allow for hip extension or adduction. You can see the baby in the picture has um, the Pavlik harness on. From six to 24 months of age, dislocation, um, Unrecon is usually unrecognized until the child begins to stand and walk and then they'll have to do a closed reduction actual surgery and then the child is in a spike of cast and I've got a picture of that in a few slides. In older children um, again it's going to be a operation uh, reduction tenotomy osteotomy correction is very difficult after age four for this so this is definitely something 
um, that we want to try and catch early on. Um, this is another reason why it's really important for babies to go to the pediatrician for all those well child checkups. Um, that's why access to medical care is really needed in children. The padlet harness is worn constantly. It is only removed for bathing. When a child is um, wearing this, they need to see the, their doctor every two weeks for proper fit and to monitor the skin condition. So this is a spica cast. Imagine how heavy a baby or even a small toddler is going to be with most of their body in a cast. And now can you imagine trying to diaper a child wearing this or trying to give a child wearing a spica cast a bath and not get any of the cast wet? That most of the time children with a spica cast, their casts end up reeking by the time the end, by the time it's time to take the cast off. Because no matter how well you diaper, no matter how hard you try, there's just going to be, you know, diapers are going to leak and it, there's no place else for it to go other than to leak into the cast and the soft material inside. All right, club foot is a complex deformity of the foot and ankle. You can read through the four different types on your slide. It is a congenital anomaly. The foot is twisted. It can involve muscles, bones, and tendons. It does occur in boys more often than girls. Usually it's bilateral in half of the cases. It tends to occur in families or in conjunction with other syndromes or with a myelomeningeal spina bifida. Club foot can be picked up on ultrasound prenatally and it, is, um, it can be confirmed by x-ray after birth. Club foot cannot be corrected by exercise. The timing for correction is crucial because at birth, those foot bones are still quite soft and pliable. They begin to ossify shortly after birth though. Sometimes they will do serial casting as in what this baby has in this picture. The casts are changed out every one to two weeks. The casting continues for eight to 12 weeks until the maximum correction is achieved. It's usually, treatment is usually done in three stages. As far as nursing care, provide emotional support for parents. I'm going to reference box 35-1 in your text for cast care instructions. That is probably something that you should know for boards and it's something that you should know for this exam. Other things you may need to do is a lot of home care teaching and I listed out some topics for you on your slide. Think about this, you may need to teach parents how to prop a pillow under the cast to prevent slippage of the cast itself. Umbrella strollers may not work well. Osteogenesis imperfecta is a pretty rare disorder. Um, and it's characterized by bone fragility. It's the kids who are made of glass. Their bones just are so brittle and they fracture all the time. The only reason I included this is that it is a possibility that you could see this on boards um, and or a Kaplan. But overall, in the realm of pediatrics, it's pretty rare. All right, scoliosis. This is a common spinal deformity. It's a complex spinal deformity in three planes, the later, lateral curvature, spinal rotation causing rib asymmetry, or thor thoracotic hypokyphosis. This can be congenital or it can develop in childhood. In this picture, see how the girl's shorts sit at an angle? They're not straight across on her hips. That's a sign of scoliosis. Bone and soft tissue tumors are things like osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. These account for 90% of all primary malignant bone tumors in children. They occur more commonly in boys. Incidence is highest during accelerated growth rate, so that is during adolescence. Peak incidence is around 15 years of age. Again, osteosarcoma or osteogenic sarcoma is again a frequent malignant bone tumor type in, found in children and its peak incidence is during the second decade of life so ages you know 10 to 20 roughly.
All right, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. This is formerly known as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It is also called idiopathic arthritis of childhood. Um, it, basically, it causes chronic inflammation of the joints and other tissues. This is an autoimmune thing. Possible causes include immunogenic susceptibility, or it can be caused from environmental triggers, such as Epstein-Barr virus, rubella, parvovirus B19, which is Fifth's disease, or a possible genetic link. You can read through the peak onset, but it usually affects kids pretty young. Um, and it's actually a heterogeneous group of diseases, and you can kind of read through the different types I have listed there. The tricky part with juvenile idiopathic arthritis is there's no definitive lag, uh, diagnostic lab test. You may see an elevated sed rate in some cases. ANA, um, a positive ANA test is common, but it's not specific just for um, juvenile, arth juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And then you may see some leukocytosis during exacerbations. X-rays early in the disease will show soft tissue swelling and joint space widening from the increased synovial fluid in the joint. Later, you could see some osteoporosis, narrow joint spaces, erosions, subluxation, or ankylosis. There is no specific cure for this. The goals of therapy are listed for you. Um, things that they can do is some physical therapy, some occupational therapy. Relief of pain is going to be through NSAIDs. Um, if NSAIDs don't work, then they can add methotrexate. Um, and then they kind of save corticosteroids as kind of a last resort. There are also some new FDA-approved drugs for children to stop and minimize the inflammatory process. And, terror, and Tanercept, I cannot say these drugs, I'll be honest, a Betacept, and I have no idea how to say the very last one. You'll have to read it on your transcript. It's, I have no idea. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> um, these drugs are injected either sub-Q um, or IV, like once a week or every two weeks, but they're on a schedule. And your textbook does talk about them. As far as promotion of general health, heat and exercise, moist heat is best for the relief of the uh, pain and stiffness of joints. Facilitating compliance means uh, that basically some accommodations may have to be made for these children at school too. Um, and then again, encourage the use of heat and exercise. And then support the child and the family. Like all things that affect children, it's not just the child who's affected, it's the whole entire family. All right, so now let's talk about lupus. Uh, lupus is more common in girls and in women ages 10 to 19 years of age. It's more common in African-American, Asian, and Hispanic children. Um, and you can read through kind of what lupus is. You guys should have learned about this already. Uh, as far as the clinical manifestations go, please see box 4812 on page 1568 in your textbook. I did list some of the clinical manifestations out for you on your slide too as well. The goals of treatment for lupus really are aimed towards supportive care. Uh, care is really focused a lot around the teaching for the child and the family. The family will likely have issues adjusting to chronic illness and the child may have body image issues with dealing with the rash, hair loss, steroid therapy, because oftentimes that causes weight gain, school and social activities, sexual activity, and even future pregnancy. Uh, therapy compliance is a very important thing. All right, so let's do a practice NCLEX question. Kristen, 10 years of age, sustained a fracture in the epiphyseal plate of her right fibula when she fell out of a tree. When discussing the injury with her parents, the nurse should consider that A, healing is usually delayed in this type of fracture. Now, is that true or false? It's in the epiphyseal plate, so it's not that it's going to be necessarily to have delayed healing, but it can affect future bone growth. So that one is false. Bone growth can be affected by this type of fracture. That's true, but let's see if there's a more correct answer. This is an unusual fracture site in young children. No, that's false because uh, fractures, especially in something like a leg and especially down at the ends of a long bone where the epiphyseal plates are, that's a common site for injury. And I told you that already. Or D, this type of fracture is inconsistent with a fall. No, that is the type of fracture that's consistent. So the only correct choice is B, bone growth can be affected by this type of fracture because it affects the epiphyseal plate. All right, 
I hope that kind of helped you guys as I rationalize that question out. And that wraps it up for this PowerPoint. Thanks.